As a loom nut, Loom Tech is a brand that I've been dying to check out, as they have a reputation for having some of the best loom out there. So after years of checking them out online, I finally decided it was time to buy one, and finally put that name to the test. I'm Shane, this is Relative Time, and today we're going to check out the Loom Tech Vortex D5. Now, some of you are probably asking that out of all the Loom Techs out there, why would I pick this one? And there are actually three good reasons, with the first two being size and price. If you go through Loom Tech's catalog, you'll quickly realize two things. First, a lot of their watches are on the larger side, as well as the pricier side of things. Whereas the Vortex here is a 42mm solar diver. So it's not only the more ideal size for my wrist, but it's also more affordable than the autos. And third, it's a compressor style diver, and longtime viewers of the channel know that I have a slight minor obsession with those, as whenever I run across one, I usually buy it to check it out. So this one, the Vortex D5, seemed like it was the right, and more importantly, the smart choice to check out the brand with. So with that out of the way, let's move on to the specs. The Vortex is a 42mm diver with a 48mm lug to lug making it a mid-sized diver, ideal for a medium-sized wrist. It is a bit chunky, especially for a quartz watch at 13.5 millimeters. But then again, it is a super compressor style watch, and those all do tend to be a little fat. And that does also include a double dome sapphire crystal with AR. Now, rounding out the specs, you also have a 22 millimeter lug width, 200 meters of water resistance with dual screw down signed crowns, and it's all powered by Seiko VS42A solar quartz movement. The case here is easily one of my favorite parts of the Vortex. It's a 316L stainless case with a bead blasted finish, which then has this gunmetal gray titanium carbide PVD coating applied, giving it a very tough militaristic looking exterior, which is still very smooth to the touch. The overall design is very clean, very straightforward, until you get to the oversized bezel and its twisted knurling, and that rises out of the case like this curvy gunmetal bubble until it meets the double dome sapphire, and that does continue along the same curvature. And as a whole, it creates this subtle, cohesive frame for the black and green dial underneath. When you first look at the watch, your eyes are immediately drawn to that eye-catching dial. Yet, at the same time, you still catch that cool texture of the knurling in your periphery. Although, as you may see here, there's also a bit of glare on that crystal as well. So maybe a few more coatings of AR would have helped. Flipping the watch over, you are greeted with a rather standard closed case back. There's nothing particularly interesting here, but it does keep the water out. Back to the front and at the right, things get a little bit more interesting with the crowns. Both are signed screw down crowns, with the lower crown at the 4 for the movement, and the upper one at the 2 for the internal bezel. Honestly, it's mostly standard stuff here, at least until you get to the action of the bezel as most of the internal bezels on compressor-style watches are freely rotating. It's actually one of the weak points for the entire genre, with a few exceptions, and this watch is one of them, as the bezel here has 120 click and is unidirectional. Now, it's definitely not perfect, as there is a bit of slop in between each click, but it's still a nice change of pace from your standard bezels, and I think it's the second best internal bezel I've run across, with the first one belonging to the Christopher Ward Super Compressor. Moving on to the dial, we run into this attractive black, white, and neon green color scheme. Although if this is not your cup of tea, then check out some of the other colorways, although all of them are a bit vibrant, with matching NATOs. Design is always a bit subjective, but I personally think this is a good looking watch. It is a bit crowded though, and that is typical of super compressors, as they do have to fit both the internal bezel and a regular dial into the same area under the crystal. So, as a result, oftentimes the dial design gets compacted a bit, as well as the hands typically look a little smaller compared to other similar sized watches. With the Vortex, I think they did a great job integrating the design of the bezel and dial, keeping that color scheme consistent and overlaying the minute indicators just outside the chapter ring. So, as a whole, I think the bezel feels more like an extension of the dial, rather than some separate entity and that winds up giving the watch a larger visual presence. Although, if I want to get nitpicky here, I think there is some redundancy in having the minute indicators on the chapter ring sitting right next to the corresponding ones on the bezel. Personally, I just would have left those out and moved the indicators back a bit, as well as minimize some of the text on the dial. 
freeing up just a little bit of space and making it feel a little less crowded. From a distance, the base of the dial appears to be a glossy black, which then has printed indices as well as a printed chapter ring applied. However, remember that this is a solar powered watch. And while that's not unheard of in the microbrand world, it is fairly uncommon to see, with this one being a Seiko Hattori VS42A. So while the dial looks to be a glossy black, what you're actually seeing is a translucent dial sitting on top of black solar cells. Now, this isn't a complete random tangent. The reason I'm mentioning this is because as I was getting macro shots, I kept seeing something faintly strange in the dial. These little lines, and it took me a little while to realize what I was actually seeing that it was most likely the circuitry of the solar movement. Like in this shot right here, you can see a line going from the one to the middle of the dial. Or what's even more interesting is that down at the four, you can make out a cutout for a date, even though this watch doesn't have a date. Now in real life, 95% of the time, you won't actually see this, but out and about with full sun and at the right angles, I would occasionally catch a glimmer of it. So maybe there's nothing necessarily wrong with all of this, but it is kind of an interesting side effect of going with the solar movement, and one I haven't seen before. Although I actually had one other massive issue with the movement, or more specifically, this specific movement, as it actually died on me, like pining for the fjords dead. I actually got this one late last year, and it's taken me this long to get around to reviewing it. But right around six months, and actually right after I showed it off in another video, I went to pick it up and it was just tits up. I stuck it on a light, thinking that it just might be out of juice, and when that didn't work I stuck it in a windowsill, but no, it was just stone cold dead. Not resting, just dead. Now that's the bad news, but the good news is that I got to test out LoomTech's warranty. And I have to say that they're pretty efficient. I emailed them telling them I had an issue, and they replied back with a form to fill out and said to send it along with the watch. So I sent it in, and less than two weeks later it was back and working fine. And I should point out that at no point in this did I ever pull the hey I'm a YouTube reviewer card. So as far as LoomTech was concerned, I was just an average customer. Now this isn't a new movement, it's one that Seiko's had out for a while. And it has been used in a variety of other watches. So while it was annoying to find it dead, I am inclined to think that this was just a fluke. But I still wanted to mention it just in case. And as long as we're talking about the movement, let's quickly talk about the second hand alignment. For those of you keeping score at home, the short answer is no, it's not lined up. I think in general, we all want quartz watches to be lined up. The only question is if we should really expect them to be. For me, at particular price points, I think you should expect that, and this watch is in that price point. Yet, at the same time, I have yet to see another brand consistently do it right, with Casio maybe being the closest. But even then, I've seen some issues with a couple of theirs. Honestly, this is a much larger and longer conversation about quartz, and feel free to comment on it down below. But for right now, for the sake of this review, let's just say it's disappointing and move on. Now at this point, I'm sure some of you are saying, hey, this is a Loom tech, why aren't you talking about Loom? In fact, I'm sure some of you probably skipped ahead to this point. But we're going to talk about it now, and the short answer as to why I haven't talked about it before is because there's not a whole lot to talk about. This isn't a watch you should buy for the Loom, as much as that pains me to say especially after hearing the reputation that's been built up around them. LoomTech lists this as having a two-tone glow X1 grade Super Luminova with MDV technology. I have no idea what MDV is, but it does sound impressive. Regardless, I do love how this one looks when the lights go out, even if some of those parts are short-lived. LoomTech knows what they're doing with design, I will give them that. But here, I'm not just concerned with the flash, but also the longevity. So in my test, I also had it up against a Seiko Turtle with good loom and a Zelos Mako 3 with great loom. And as you can see, while the dial fades out first, the hands are overall on par with those of a Seiko Turtle. So I'd say it's good, like Seiko good, but after all the micro brands I've seen, that's kind of the baseline for what they should be trying for. So while it's good, it's not fantastic or even memorable for that matter and definitely not something I'd name a whole brand after. Now, it is possible that this is just an off model, and I am very open to trying more in the future. 
But for me personally, if you're going to call yourself Loom Tech, you kind of need to bring it and bring it every time. And not just sometimes, and especially not at this price. So again, the Loom here is good. It just seems that the reputation that's been built up around Loom Tech is more legend than reality. But I digress. Let's move on to the strap. The Vortex comes with a matching black and green NATO. And at this price, I think it's very debatable on whether or not this should have come with something more like, say, a bracelet. But regardless of that, I have to say that this is a great premium NATO. It is a very nice soft texture with a good thickness, all while having great matching hardware. Honestly, it's one of the best NATOs I've seen. However, I didn't actually use it very much. On my seven and a quarter inch wrist, it's overall comfortable and I can easily wear it all day. But I don't think a NATO is the ideal strap for the Vortex because when you already have a watch that's pretty thick, a NATO is the last thing you want to put on it. Especially when it's paired with a flatter profile on the back. A NATO just tends to exasperate both of those issues. So my recommendation would be to swap it to a good flexible two-piece. It may not look quite as cool, but it definitely improves the comfort level. Lastly, let's talk value, or maybe lack of here, as MSRP of the Vortex is a whopping 585 US. Now, I hate to be that guy, the one that always says a $30 movement in a $600 watch, are you nuts? Just because there's so much more that goes into a watch than the movement. But here, that's not entirely wrong. I mean, most other solar watches out there will be half this price, and most other compressors around this price will have a good high beat auto. Although to be fair, to play devil's advocate here, I should point out that the build quality of the case, the dial, the hands, everything here is top notch. And that this watch is designed, assembled, and tested in Ohio. Yet at the same time, I also look at my Notice Duality, one I bought when they first came out for about the same price. And that's a watch that was also designed and assembled in the US, and has a build quality as good, if not better, than the Vortex here. Not to mention a gorgeous bracelet and a much more complex and intricate dial. So a $30 movement in a $600 watch, are you nuts? Bottom line, I like the Vortex. It's a cool design that's rather well made, which is something I think you can say about a lot of Loomtex. But while I like it, I don't exactly love it, and especially not enough to justify the price. If this was 400 bucks, maybe even five with a nice bracelet, I would look at it and tell you that it's high, but still within some realm of reason. But as it is right here, this is one I can't make much of an argument for. For me, as the reviewer, it was worth buying just to get a real experience with the brand. But for you at home, unless you can get a really good deal on it, I think it's best just to leave it in the YouTube playlist. It's just too expensive to recommend. Anyway, as usual, let me know your thoughts on this watch down below, as well as what are your thoughts on Loom Tech in general, especially if you've actually owned one. I'd love to hear your experiences. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. It really does help the channel. I'm Shane. This is Relative Time. See you next time.